going to turn for a brief Bible reading to the New Testament, to the book of Ephesians. We're reading from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus and reading from chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, and commencing to read at verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. A little moment of prayer just before we come to the Word of God. Loving Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus, our living and ascended Lord, and we thank you this evening for every New Testament letter that was written primarily to a group of believers somewhere in Asia Minor or in the great Roman Empire. But we thank you, Lord, that these were written for our instruction also, that we might, through reading the Scriptures, be learned, taught, and that we might learn from Thee, Lord. And so we pray that that same Holy Spirit, of which we have been singing just now, that this ministry of the Spirit will be implanted within our hearts, and that in this final part of this evening service, that Jesus Christ will be glorified. You know, Lord, all that's going on in the realm of the unseen that we cannot see, but we trust Thee, Lord, for Thou art greater, and greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. And so tonight we claim the authority and the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our gracious God and our victorious Savior over the final moments of this service for the honor and glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now let's have the reading. Paul the Apostle says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And amen, and may God bless the reading of his precious word to our hearts this evening. Living in the power of the Spirit is the title of my message, and this evening as we share now in the concluding moments of the service, I trust that we will uh, receive something from the Word of God and something that will stir and draw and move in our hearts. There are approximately 12 significant prayers in the New Testament that were spoken and prayed by the Apostle Paul. And when we take those 12 prayers and put them together, they express a vision and a passion and a power and a wealth that is so immense as to overwhelm our minds. Paul did not pray for small things. He prayed for large and expansive and extensive blessings. And this is one of those great, great highlight prayers of the New Testament, this letter to the church at Ephesus. What an amazing epistle this is. What a remarkable church this was. These were people who had been converted from witchcraft and from idolatry. The goddess of the city of Ephesus was called Diana. And out of that worship to Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians, there was a lucrative business in silversmithing. And these little images that were made to the goddess Diana produced a lot of wealth. 
to all those who were involved in that business. But when the Apostle Paul came and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, the immense power of the cross of Calvary, and the wonderful delivering power of Jesus Christ from the bondage of spiritism, black magic, white magic, whatever kind of magic you want to speak about, all the books that were in existence in the city of Ephesus that the people followed and procured all their practices from, when the gospel of the Lord Jesus came into the city of Ephesus, all of this was leveled by the power of that mighty gospel of Jesus Christ. And my dear people tonight, the immense power of the message of the cross work of Jesus cuts right across all the dark and sinister powers that are in the world even tonight. And I'm so thankful this evening that there is not a bondage, there is not a darkness, there is not a cult worship that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not adequate to deal with. And these people who were dead in trespasses and in sin, who were governed by the God of this world, who were driven by that relentless power of darkness, were gloriously saved and brought to life through the message of the gospel of the grace of God. And when Paul wrote to the people about seven years after that glorious visitation, that initial visitation at Ephesus, he said, By grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that is the very bedrock of the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. It's not of works. It's not by self-effort. It's not by the number of prayers we pray. It's not by the amount of money that we give to good causes or to the church. It's not by all the pedigree that would be upright and downright, and in right, and would seem to us all right. It's not by that tonight that we are saved and brought into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's by the message of the precious blood of Jesus being applied to our sinful hearts, and us brought to a place of conviction and concern, and brought to that place of true repentance, where we Turn and seek the Lord, and helped by His Spirit, we pass from death to life, from the power of sin and Satan unto God, and we are transformed. Years ago, in a tent campaign that we had in another town in Northern Ireland, there was a young lady who was in Stranmillis Training College, training to be a teacher. She came from a Christian family. Her mother and father were both believers and prayed much for her, as did her siblings. But she would come to the meetings, and she didn't particularly want to be in the meetings, but she was there because of her admiration and her respect for her parents. But you know, one night at 12 o'clock, God spoke into her heart when she had gotten into her bed, and he spoke very clearly to her in the words of a song that you might have heard. Someday you'll hear God's final call to you to take his offer of salvation true. So pertinent was the conviction that fell upon her. So fearsome was the presence of God that she dropped down beside her bed to her knees and cried out to the Lord Jesus to have mercy upon her and save her. She went to her parents' bedroom, knocked the door, and went into the room and said to her parents, I have just been converted. I have just got saved. A lovely, bright, fine, intelligent, uh, educated, going-to-be professional young lady and the next night when she was sitting in the tent mission, after the meeting was over, she said to her mother, she says, Mom, have I sat in meetings like that before tonight? Her mother said, Heather, yes, you have. You see, the difference was that now the illuminating power of the gospel 
had brought her to a concept or an awareness that God is real, that Jesus Christ is real, that the indwelling Holy Spirit is real, and the things to which she was dead, now she had become alive. And the things to which she was alive were now dead. Hallelujah. My friends, it was like that with me. It was like that with me. The night I was converted a Saturday night, Sunday morning, it seemed like I'd never lived a Sunday morning like that before. Everything seemed new. And that afternoon being the last meeting of the, of the mission, it was a three-week mission, and I stuck it out till the last night but one. There was a meeting in the afternoon for all those who had been saved during the mission. Well, we got home from church, and as soon as we got the dinner over, I jumped on the bicycle. I was 16 years and a half old at that time, and it was six miles to the town of Oma, and I was there half an hour before the meeting was due to start. I was pumped up. <laughs> I had not felt like that before about the things of God. God took the enmity out of my heart. God took the darkness out of my mind. The Spirit of God opened up the channels of my heart to the mercy and grace of Jesus, and Jesus became a living person within my heart. Oh, my people, the 3rd of March, 1962, will always be emblazoned on my heart, and when I get to heaven, I'll be so happy for that blessed night when Jesus washed my black heart white. He taught me how to sing and shout and live for Jesus out and out. Happy night, oh, happy night, when Jesus washed my black heart white. Friends, I'm so thankful tonight that it was wasn't just me he saved then, but he had a plan for my life. And he did something for me as a young Christian man when I was 19 years of age. The Spirit of God came upon me in power, and I moved from being shy and retiring and from having some inner challenges and difficulties with thoughts and tempers, that the Holy Spirit dealt a blow to all of those internal things in a sanctifying baptism on the last Friday night of February 1965. It moved me so much that I was moved to this day. I will never forget that second encounter in fire with God. And from then, the Lord began to open the doors for me, and there was an invitation to join an open-air team in Straban. And I began to witness and go to the public houses and take the Challenge magazine there. Then we stood at the bank corner. We always had the bank behind us and God above us, so we were rich in every way, and told the people about a Savior who could save them. You know, a little later on, I find myself on a boat sailing out of Ireland for the very first time in my life, just 20 years of age, the Glasgow boat on the way to Edinburgh to the Bible College to prepare for the work of the kingdom. And you know, that night, Saturday night, after we got there, the first Saturday night, I was at a little single bed in a big house in Edinburgh, in a big, uh, big rich area where the Rolls Royces went down the avenue in the Monday morning as people went on their way to work in the Bentleys. I'd never seen a Rolls Royce in Tyrone. All you saw was tractors and bicycles and horses down there. But you know, I was in a friend, a different world. And when I got down to pray that Saturday night, I began to cry. Because if I stayed at home, I was going to be the inheritor of not just one farm, but two farms of land. And as I was praying, I always remember, it was an uncle of Naomi's that came into our room, and she's sitting down here, Edward Douglas, and he got down beside me, and he said, Eric, it's hard, isn't it? I said, Mr. Douglas, it's hard. I never heard a cow roar all day. I never heard a pig grunt. I didn't hear the sheep bleat. I knew nothing. I'd left the potato sorter in the potato shed to jump into a car and take into the boat and set off, my friends. And that was a turning point for me again. But I look back tonight and you say, Eric, have you any regrets? Not one regret. 
Not one regret. My father and mother, my sister told me years later, she said, Eric, we'll never forget that day. She said, when you were taken out from the yard and set off, she says, it was like a wake at our home. She said, it was like a funeral, a death had come. I never knew that. But I was so blessed in the latter years of my parents' ministry to be their pastor and to preach at my father's funeral. I tell you, my friends, God pays back a hundredfold when you put your life on the line for Jesus. A hundredfold. And would I exchange it for all the cows and all the milk and all the pigs and all the sheep. The first beasts that I ever owned were sheep and the next were pigs and I was on my way to get a cow if I could have had the money to bought her. But friends, God gave me souls for the kingdom of Jesus and gave me people for the sanctifying fire of God and it's worth living for this. Charles Wesley said in his hymn, "'Tis worth living for this, to administer bliss and salvation in Jesus' name. And the fire still burns in my heart. And here the Apostle Paul is writing to these people. I've almost got away from my message tonight, but I hope you'll pardon me, bringing you into a kind of a practical experience of what is so real to me that I want to see so real in you also. As this man writes to these seven-year-old believers, he said, Ah, there's more for you than what you have received. I'm on my knees for you praying. My friends, what's wonderful when somebody comes up and says, I'm praying for you. We have people who say, I pray for you every day. I met a man a year or two ago. I hadn't seen him for maybe 15, 20 years. And we were talking and sharing together. And his wife was very ill. I wasn't to know that at the time. But, you know, he said to me, he looked at me in the eye sitting in his home. And he said, you know, he said, Eric, I pray for you every day. Every day. But I tell you, when the Apostle Paul says, I'm praying for you, that lifts me up another few steps in the ladder to think that this man, so used by God, would be somewhere on his knees praying for not just the believers at Ephesus, but praying for me tonight by extension. And what is he praying for me what is he praying for you, even tonight as believers in the Lord Jesus, in this wonderful, wonderful prayer? We say, how are you going to get it through tonight now by nine o'clock, Eric? Well, what do you see? You haven't seen the last miracle yet. Just you hang on. We'll get there soon. I'll not keep you too long because I know you want to get home. But you know, the first thing he prays for, he says, I'm praying that God would energize your life with power. Listen to the words, the very first words of that wonderful verse. Ephesians 3.16. Isn't that interesting? Here's another 3.16. There's some great 3.16s, you know, in the New Testament. You start looking for them. Here's one of them, that the God would grant you. <laughs> Somebody said, you know, whenever you use that word, all the farmers waking up because they're always looking for a grant. Well, here he says, God's going to grant you something. He's going to grant you according to the riches of his glory. Man, I tell you, that is something amazing. We got an email some time ago, and it said that uh, uh, was a wealthy man. I've forgotten his name now. Uh, Warren Buffett, I think his name was. But he was giving so many thousands of dollars. It was a vast amount, I can't remember. But he was giving this money away to every pensioner in the world. And I thought, well, I'm sure this money will run out. I was to learn it was a spam message. He wasn't giving away his money to pensioners at all. We, me, one, and I thought we were landed. We're going to buy a Rolls Royce and a yacht and a motor home, and we'd have a great time. My friends, God looks down and he says, I have the storehouse. And I am granting you something tonight that's not a spam message. He says, this is real genuine that he would grant you according to. That's immense. 
That's different than saying, I'm going to give you something out of. Out of is a, is a portion, a percentage of a certain amount. But according to, and whenever his riches and glory are infinite riches, and he gives according to those riches, you cannot put a boundary on that. You cannot put a boundary on that. And my dear people, there is a boundless measure in the ministry of the Spirit for the church of Jesus Christ and for every individual believer that makes me ask the question, why are we not somewhat different to what we are? That makes me ask the question, why is the church not somewhat different to what we are? Is it that we have not, as, 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 as uh, Anita said, is it that we have not appropriated, embraced, received, experienced what is available in Him? Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to that alone laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. The most commonly used word in the New Testament for energy, power, might, or anything like that to do with the ministry of the Spirit is the word dunamis. It's used 118 times. And it's the word from which we get the word dynamite. Now, we know plenty of things about dynamite in Ireland. My friends, tonight, there is a dynamite power in the Spirit of God that doesn't blast our lives to pieces, but puts our lives together into something that is living and vibrant for Jesus Christ. You say, you know, Eric, I don't really understand your doctrine, but I somehow feel it might meet the need of my heart. A businessman said that one night after a meeting in Dromore. He said, I don't fully understand what you're talking about, but he said, it explains the need of my life. You say, Eric, I don't fully understand what you're speaking about, but it explains the need of my life. This is what I feel I need. I feel enfeebled. I feel inadequate. I feel that I am tied sometimes by certain things that are distempers in my being that I cannot free myself from or thoughts that I have in my mind or aversions or bitterness, or carnal anger, or a divisiveness, or a critical tongue, or a gossiping mouth. I I, I would love to be shot free from all these things that somehow mar my testimony. Could the Holy Spirit so come on my life to purge and cleanse and empower my life so that I then might come to appreciate what it is to live in the power of the Spirit. Then he says something else. He says, I am praying for you that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Now, I've put all that together really for the sake of time. You say, well, Eric, did Christ not dwell in the hearts of these people? Yes, he did. They couldn't have been Christ without Christ dwelling within them. But if you were to go behind the surface text of the passage and that wonderful phrase, you would be introduced in the original to a depth of dwelling that is significantly deeper than the initial dwelling in Christ. 
that we experience when we are born again of the Spirit of God. The word that Christ may dwell in your hearts means to dwell intensely and deeply. In other words, to make himself totally at home. Totally at home. And whenever the Spirit of God takes possession of his priority, presidentially, the Lord Jesus, whom the Spirit represents, whom he has come to glorify, feels perfectly at home, where all the furnishings are clean, where every shelf is cleaned of every idol of self, and he has he has access to all the rooms of our lives. Was it not F.B. Mayer who said there were every room that Jesus could go, but there was one room? He said, I held the key to that room. That was my little bit of territory that I wanted to hold on to. But the Holy Spirit kept working until F.B. Mayer said, I handed over all the keys. And he said he has been walking through every room since. In the White House, there is a special room. It's called the Oval Room. It's the place where the president can go. He has the right to go into the Oval Room. My friends, I've got an Oval Room in my life. And through the gracious work of the Spirit, coming and purifying the heart, coming and empowering the life, he has access to the oval room, and he can walk through all the rooms. Sometimes we go to homes, and the people will say, make yourself at home. Can you imagine, you kick off your shoes, set them up on the table, you put them up on the mantelpiece, then you go up in the night and you just walk into every bedroom in the house and you just take possession, oh, I like this room, I'll take this room. And the owner of the house says, oh, you can't take that room, that's our room. <laughs> My friends, every room. Oh, but you told me to make myself at home. <laughs> when I'm at my home, I go in all the rooms in my home. Does he have access to all the rooms of your life? All the areas? All the attitudes? All the ambitions? All the wishes? He says, I want to dwell deeply, intensely. And I want to tell you that there is a fuller revelation of Jesus Christ to the purified soul. Because even Jesus speaks about that in the Beatitudes when he says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And he comes to this one, blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Let me give it to you in the original in the Greek. Oh, the blessedness of the pure in heart. They see God. It's not something that's futuristic. It's something that is currently present. And there is a clarification of the vision. When carnality is driven out, there is an intensity of the dwelling. When the Spirit takes total possession and the life is saturated with the presence of God, that Christ may dwell in your heart. And he says, I want you to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now we're just skipping along here and drawing into a close. My dear people, I have yet to comprehend what that phrase means or can mean that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. How in the ever-rolling ages of time or eternity can the immensity of God whom the heaven of heavens cannot contain, as the Bible says. How can I, a 
creature of a day, a dust put together, and indwelt by his living soul, that God can possess me in all his royal fullness. My friends, that's something for which yet I aspire. That is something that I have yet to embrace, to comprehend. Except to say, Lord, you know what you mean when you say that. Please make it real to me. Oh, fill me with thy fullness, Lord, until my very heart and life overflows in kindling thought and glowing word, thy love to tell, thy praise to show. My dear, it was John Fletcher, the saintly Fletcher of Medley, you know, when they asked Voltaire, the atheist, famous French atheist, have you ever met anyone like Jesus? Have you ever seen anyone like Jesus? Yes, he said. The vicar of Medley. A few years ago, Yvonne and I stood at the side of John de la Fletcher's grave there in Staffordshire, in Shropshire, rather. He was called the Seraphic Fletcher. Because as he came before the people, the, the, the glory of a seraph was on John Fletcher. A holier man I have yet to meet on earth, said John Wesley. The saintly Fletcher. Voltaire said, that's a man that's like Jesus. I want to tell you that the grace of God that was available to John Fletcher is available to everybody. It's a matter of putting our lives on the line. And what did Fletcher pray? This is what I wanted to get at and almost forgot it. He says, I pray daily, Lord, enlarge the capacity. Enlarge the capacity. My dear people tonight, there's a lovely hymn I don't think it's in the making melody. It might be, but there's a wonderful verse that says, Come to me in all thy fullness. Take possession of my soul. Take the will. I scarce can yield thee. Sanctify and cleanse the whole. I am waiting. I am willing. Could you take yourself by that? Could you stand beside that? sentence tonight. I am waiting. I am willing. Thine and only thine to be. Make my heart thy living temple. Come today and dwell intensely, deeply in me. You say, Eric, you're speaking in superlatives. This is beyond the common man's reach. This is out with the ordinary believer's reach. It's not possible. Was the Apostle Paul inspired by the Spirit or was he praying in the self-energy of the flesh? You know the answer to that. This is a divinely inspired prayer. Unless the devil should step up and say, this can never be yours, God has given us an answer. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think That just blows my mind away. That just keeps on going. Larger and larger. The larger Christian life. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us to him be the glory. My friends, every endowment of God is not for the glorification of ourselves, 
but for the glorification of Jesus. And every time and every altar that you ever erect, and every sacrifice that you make, and every offering that you put upon it, even your whole body, soul, and spirit, yield it to him on whom the fire and presence of God comes down. Jesus is glorified. And what is man's chief end? To glorify God. And I want to bring to my Lord the maximum glory so that he is seen, he is glorified, and through my yielded life, endued with power, endowed with perfect love, filled with all the fullness of God, might be to the praise and honor and glory of him who gave everything he had to make me his own and then to possess me and make me usable from this day forward. One of my treasurers in my first church was a very shy man. He was the father of Stanley Mawinney. Some of you have heard of him. Stephen McWhinney would be a grandson. Well, Mr. McWhinney, as we knew him, sat under my ministry, and he listened to me many times, and from time to time the Lord would speak into his heart. And then there came that night, one night when he woke up in the night, and God was dealing with him. And he got out by his bedside, and he got down, and he prayed, Refining fire go through my heart. Illuminate my soul. Scatter thy life through every part and sanctify the whole. And he said, God, he came to the manse the next day or two, and he said, God came down on me, he said, and I wept and wept. This man was in his 70s. He had been saved in the 1920s under W.P. Nicholson. This was now the 1970s. Fifty years later, he said, God came down in my soul. I wept and wept. I felt dissolved. And then he said, the words came to me, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And Mr. Mawinney, as we called him, was so invigorated and empowered by the Spirit that the shy retiring man became a tracting man for the Lord Jesus and took himself where to in those years in the 70s when the troubles were at their height in Belfast, took him to the bar barriers where he gave out gospel literature to the soldiers. He would never have done that before. God gave him a baptism of love and a baptism of power that lifted him to another level of spiritual living. And I always remember him praying in the prayer meetings as a gentleman, an old gentleman, Lord, you have told us in your word that we are living epistles known and read of all men. Lord, make us good reading. Make us good reading. I'm through tonight. It's been quite an evening, hasn't it? Maybe for you particularly. You say, you know, Eric, there is something stirring in my soul. There is a longing. There is a desire. Praise God. Praise God for that. See, I don't fully understand. Lord, although I may not understand in childlike faith, now I stretch forth my hand and on thy promise I dare to rely, cleansing for me, cleansing for me. Lord, in thy love and thy power make me strong that all may know that to thee I belong. 
And ever let this be my song, cleansing from thee, cleansing from thee. Oh, my dear people, who is a candidate for blessing? Who is a candidate for the prayer that was prayed by God's unique servant, Paul? Who would be a candidate for the appetites and desires of the Spirit that are expressed in this prayer? Say, you know, I want that enjoyment. I want that deep, intense, full abiding of Jesus and his exalted glory. I want that fullness, Lord, that out of my innermost being there would flow rivers of living water. Let's bow together in prayer.